Now on four, how modern technology came to the rescue of a remote people. In the western province of Papua New Guinea, there's a small town with a small hospital called Barlimore. It's one of the remotest places on earth, surrounded by 10,000 square miles of jungle and swamp. <laughs> Until the 1930s, when the missionaries first settled here, the lifestyle of the Gogodala people hadn't changed for thousands of years. Even today, it's subsistence living. Food comes from the jungle and the rivers. Sago is the staple diet. In this watery wilderness, there are no roads to speak of. Those that can afford it fly. For everyone else, canoes are the only way to get about. Graham Zirk has spent six years here as a missionary doctor. And he has a burning mission, to bring the benefits of modern medicine to the far-flung tribes of this region. Much of the work is away from Barlingmore Hospital on patrol. The medicine isn't really the problem. These days, most diseases are curable. But reaching the sick people is. That's why I came up with the idea for a hovercraft. Dragging through this jolly grass is enough of a nuisance at this time of year when the water's high. But during the dry, you're actually pushing across mud and it's twice as hard. And so it's easy to see where the inspiration for a hovercraft came, where you could have something that could just go straight over the lot of the stuff. I also wanted to extend the reach of our medical services. The fact is, people often die here because they can't make it to hospital in time. With what we're travelling in at the moment, it can take hours to get down to these villages down here. And the poor people have got very little that they can call by way of medical service at the moment. And so, consequently, we really want to get these hovercraft servicing these people and servicing them well so that they get the same sort of care as what the villagers close to the hospital have been able to enjoy for many years now. When you travel along the river and see some of these villages, the beautiful palm trees swaying in the breeze and the sun beating down on the lovely river, it looks idyllic, but it's an illusion. In fact, everything is hard. Survival is difficult. The jungle's always trying to take over their gardens. 
The gardens are either suffering from not enough water during the dry season or being washed away during the torrential rains of the wet. So nutrition is a problem. They have to work hard to get any meat that they hunt in the jungle. They have to fight off the mozzies. They have to fight off disease. Their skin is always itchy with fungus and scabies and the like. And so uh, while it may look idyllic, that really is an illusion. Life is hard and uh, they have to be tough to survive. This one here? Thank you very much. The little fella who lives in this house over here has been one of our leprosy patients for the last six or seven years. He's actually a very smart little boy who did well at school. But we're... Hello, Mickey. Hello. How are you? Going to give us a look at your leg and your hand? Right, mate. Do you mind if I come in? Is that OK? OK, Mickey, let's have a look at your leg, mate. I became a missionary doctor for a couple of reasons. Oh, goodness. How long has that big ulcer been there for? It was an opportunity to practice what I preach. And also, it really is a fantastic way to practice medicine because the work back in Australia, it's good. But you know that if you're not there, there are thousands of others who could do just the same work. Whereas in a place like this, you come and you can actually make a significant difference, not just to the individuals who you treat, but to whole villages. And that really is very professionally satisfying. At the moment at Barlingmore, the surgeon who does leprosy surgery work to help get these, your hands straightened out and working a bit better is there. So I think it's a good idea for you to come back to Barlingmore with us. What do you think about that? Is that okay? A hovercraft seemed the perfect answer to Zerk. The only problem was how to get hold of one. He contacted HoverAid in the UK and they took up his challenge. Now, five long years after his original idea, the dream is about to become reality. An expedition from Britain is bringing two craft to set up a hover doctor service for Barleymore Hospital. The team leader is Wing Commander Gordon Goodman. Back in Britain, he's a navigator in the Royal Air Force. Ahead lies a tough challenge. He and his team must create a hover doctor service in a country they've never seen and in conditions that even a hovercraft will find difficult. Their base for the next few months will be this empty mission house. It's been a long time in planning, in three years or so. I had the last seven months on it the whole time and uh, now we've got the lagoon in front of us and this is the first challenge, the hovercraft coming and seeing what it'll make of all this grass. I thought it was going to be water at this time of year, it's supposed to be high water, but the hovercraft should tackle that. It's uh, made for going through the grass, it's made for going over the dry ground, it's made for going over the water. So we'll see how we get on. We've got two months now, uh, the challenge is on, we've got the garage to build, We've got to get the craft up and working. We've got to get the drivers trained. And then we've got to see just how far the uh, whole thing can go and see whether we can take these hovercraft um, as far east, north, south, and west that uh, the hospital goes to. And uh, that's a challenge the next couple of months. But it's nice to be here. The expedition members come from every walk of life, but they share two things, their Christianity and a determination to make the Hover Doctor service succeed. Just a hush for a bit of grace. Lord, we thank you very much for this food on this beautiful evening, on your day. Amen. Food 
is mostly military rations. The team have all helped raise money for the expedition and to buy the hovercraft. It's come from their own pockets, from churches and from sponsorship. <laughs> Would anybody like some tea? Yes, I'm afraid it's on the weak side. There weren't that many tea bags in there after all. They're a mixed bunch. Engineers, doctors and other professionals and two medical students here as part of their course, Aileen Boyd and Sarah Williams. Papua New Guinea is a place that I've always been very excited by. It seems to be a country of a um, great deal of mystery. Um, and also the healthcare here is much, much more basic than at home. I've been used to hospitals with so much equipment, plenty of aids to diagnosing things like ultrasounds and CT scanners and things like that, but here there's nothing. The hospital at Balimore looks after 35,000 people. For this, they've got two doctors and 37 full-time nursing staff. Once you become used to the heat and the smells and sights, there's also a fantastic amount of medicine. You get all the stuff that you're going to have at home, plus all the extra tropical stuff. So there's a whole new world that opens up. This girl's an absolutely typical case, a lady who's been admitted with an acute dose of malaria. She's actually just come from the Kamusi logging camp, which is two rivers away from us. This girl, for example, has got an enlarged spleen. You'll feel, feel more spleens here than you will in the lifetime <laughs> of Cambridge or Oxford, that's for sure. <laughs> Have a feel. Have a feel, yes. Okay. Cam Sam. Come big, big alley. Oh, yeah. And here's a poor chap who's looked like he's had a few rounds with a sabre-toothed tiger, but in fact there's far more common injury for around here, and that's pig bites, where he's had multi multiple injuries from a pig. It's common for a couple of reasons. One is because the pigs are such cunning creatures, and secondly is that the people love their meat, yeah. and so hunt them quite frequently. Crocodile bites are never quite so uh, dramatic in terms of the dressings, but they're much more terrible what to the do? local injury they do. cause. Well, I'm looking forward to learning a lot of medicine, particularly about some new diseases, some tropical diseases that I haven't seen before, and also probably the opportunity to see diseases that have progressed to a much later stage than you would see at home. The first hovercraft has arrived safely, but there's still a lot of work to do. One of the most important jobs is to build a garage for the craft, for security, and to protect them from the extremes of the tropical weather. Four weeks later, the second hovercraft is finally here, and the real work of testing and exploring can begin. Well, this is the moment we're waiting for. Moton Chief has now arrived at what they call Barleymore, but actually this is Coconut Island, about six miles from our final destination. And you can see on the Moton Chief, the hovercraft is there on the tarpaulins, and it's looking great. This is tremendous. Now, finally, we've got both hovercraft here. It's an exciting moment. I also realise the real job is about to begin. I'm a bit concerned to see just how well these craft are going to operate. We're going to take them long distances. We're going to take them to places they've never been. We've just tested them on a quarry in England so far. And now we've got to really try okay, them out. Down. It's got to go out further. Take it down.
It's a very new idea, something that you won't have seen in Balamore before today. If you can imagine um, one of your local four-wheel drives, one of your Range Rovers or Land Cruisers, without wheels. A crucial aim of the expedition imagine is to train a team away, of locals to drive and maintain the hovercraft. A big cushion of air. And that's how it's Graham Benke's job to show the them how. The way it works is by a couple of fans inside the hovercraft itself. One of them is here. And it draws air in through a hole in the top of the hovercraft and blows it down underneath, like this. And this air gets trapped by the two big, or the big bag underneath, and the, the amount of air increases, so the pressure of air increases, okay? And this slowly lifts the hovercraft up off the ground. To move it forward, we have more air passing through two fans at the side on the back, okay? And they, they come in and they're blown out the back by these big fans, and that pushes the hovercraft forward. Takami Saida is one of four people being trained to drive the hovercraft. I was scared because it was new to me and then it was a bit fast. When I first drove it, it was a bit difficult to me because tractors are a bit different than uh, overcraft. Because tractors got clutch and brakes, but this one, instead of brakes and clutch, there's a uh, leg steering at the overcraft. So I thought that I was trying to change the gears, but instead I was turning the overcraft around on the direction which I was pressing my ribs. This is actually quite a frustrating time. The hovercraft are working, but they're, they're not working well, and they're not working up to specification. The engineers are gradually improving things, but we seem to be spending more and more time in the garage. When I want to get out and about and see how far we can go. Handfuls, and then you can sort of keep on draining it out and see if there's any more water in the water. bottom there. Second old gun going in. You got it, Michael? Yep, I've got it. One of the fingers. That's all right. That's good. Made for it. All my expeditions have been very military, and therefore I've always had a higher command to go to. Here we're out on our own. We've raised the money to come out as a group of Christians. We've got to uh, do the job as a group now. Um, if we want anything, we've got to send for it from here. We can't just pass the buck. Hey, look, you're tipping it. Yeah. No, no, just lift it up. Gordon. Yes. Well, they must have done. Give them a shout from the hospital, because they know they're, you're t they're taking you. The frustrations of Papua New Guinea, I suppose, are much the same as any third world country. Oh, for goodness sake, can't people do as they're told? We come from a land where yeah. communication is easy, telephones are easy, the roads are there, and so communication is taken for granted. Here, the opposite is true. Why did they go without you? So I never expected the infrastructure to be easy, oh, yeah. and it will cause a continuous frustration, but nothing unexpected. Try getting on the radio from, from the hovercraft and bring them back. OK, um, you, can you reach them from there? Thanks so much. Cheers, Paul. Goodness me. Goodness me. The main purpose of the expedition is to get to the Fly River by hovercraft. The area is so remote, there are villages here with no effective medical services at all. From the aerial recce, there seem to be two possible routes. Downriver to the Fly Estuary, but that's open water and probably too dangerous for the hovercraft, or upriver to Ali and then cutting south through the swamps. Uh, this is a forest just south of Ali, and that's no good for us at all. It's far too thick. So what I'm looking for, as we come up to Ali now, is a gap with a creek that goes south from Ali, and that should take us most of the way. There's the creek we want to follow. Keep going. This is going straight south. 
Well, it's fairly thick in places, but it's worth a try to see how far south we can go. This is fantastic. Just what I've been looking forward to most. Going into the unknown and exploring, and seeing just how far these craft can go. Navigation-wise, we've got a global positioning system on board, so it should be easy. But actually, it's quite hard. The maps are old, the rivers are constantly changing course. The reality is, it all looks the same. There are no major features to work on. Jonathan, you found your way out once. You found your way out once. Can't go through there. Right on the minimum that I've set to return to Kuitor. We haven't quite got to Ali. This is a disappointment, but I suppose this is an example of uh, Papua New Guinea as its logistic best or, or worst. I've tried for four weeks now to get two drums of fuel upstream to Ali or Makapa, which is two thirds of the way, to give us some fuel in which to get through to the fly. But this is not the route. But there we are. That's, uh, that's the way these expeditions go, and we're running out of time and I haven't got time to get the fuel back to Ali to uh, have another go, much as I'd love to. Nagada, <laughs> Ade. You're not TV. What the hell you? Keep up, keep up, keep All but one more. Need to gear up. Yeah. The Labour Ward's a happy place because these people really love their children. But the success of our medical work in reducing infant mortality, making people live longer, has in fact been a sweet irony in many respects because we've, it's led to a population explosion. Therefore, meaning we have to redouble our efforts towards family planning in the medical work that we're doing, not just here, but also out on the patrols that the clinic staff do. Yeah. Okay, when you feel the pain here, that's when you push hard, okay? It's well over an hour now since this lady was in second stage of labour. The baby's heart rate is just starting to slow down a little bit. So sister's going to apply a vacuum extractor to expedite the delivery. <laughs> Over the years, the doctors have encouraged women to give birth in hospital rather than in the bush. They've inoculated the children and set up a basic healthcare service. Now the question is, will the environment be able to support this rapidly growing population? Change anywhere is inevitable, but in Papua New Guinea we see it before our eyes. 
For me, it's a constant dilemma. Just how much should we interfere? This was a complicated labour, and the truth is, if this child had been born in the bush, it would have died. Probably the mother too. <laughs> Come on, Chief. Let's hear it. Just by being here, we're agents of change. We bring in drugs. We even bring in diseases like measles. We bring in hovercraft. It's a dilemma without an easy answer. I don't believe that we in the Western world should have our super heart surgery and all the good things and not share them at all with anybody else. We could leave them all alone here and we could leave them to die in their infancy and we could leave them to uh, um, dwell in pain in childbirth. We could leave them to die in childbirth. We could leave them to die young. Instead, we come here with cures for leprosy. We come here with our surgical abilities. We come here with the antivenine to help the snake bites so that fathers live, brothers live, mothers live, children live. I don't believe we can ever deny that from our Western culture to anybody. And we've just done a little bit here at Barleymore in this area of the Gogodala people to help them. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. I believe it's our moral, social and Christian duty to do so. A vital part of the medical work is going out to the villages for regular clinics. I think one of the happiest times is being out on patrol with the nurses, just enjoying their company and enjoying sharing with them about their lives out here and learning from them. Oh my word, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Woke up for the TV! Woo! Woo! Come on, TV! Welcome, welcome. Give us a lead. Let's have a quick look at that. It was fun enough, but they are. And what happened there? Oh, look! Oh, that's just the immunisations. Can I get some of those? My views of medicine have changed since I've been out here. I think I've seen how important the nursing services are out here. The fact that the nurses here are trained to diagnose and to treat patients and they do so much of the work. It makes me realise that I think that doctors at home are perhaps rather overrated. <laughs> Have you seen the hovercraft anywhere? No. No. We've lost it. That way. It could be somewhere in here. We've no idea. It's broken down. We've heard, and we can't find it anywhere. You haven't seen it. Things are starting to go wrong. Steve Moody is the chief hovercraft engineer. It's a big place. It's a big place. If only we get five feet up in here, I could see it. It's a problem when you got. 15 miles of flat water, oh, loads of grass around. Have you had this problem before? No, things have been pretty smooth up till now. The actual craft has gone well, very well. We're slowly making improvements. We had some problems with it first of all, but we're slowly getting it more operational. But this is a bit of a bit of a downer. The trouble is with this grass; it grows up four or five feet in some places. And the crafts have settled down to about about three or four feet. So it could be anywhere in there. That's the track where the hovercraft goes up there. That's why the craft is here, because it can go anywhere, but unfortunately it went anywhere and it's broken down there. Meters. Meters. Can we get them? Looks like it's straight through grass. You're not going to put the needle in. <laughs> it's good learning from the nurses how to immunise. You know. This is this a subcut. Mrs. Right, Mr. Sir, I'm giving it sub yeah, That's fine. No, they don't teach us this sort of thing in England. <laughs> I think that the nurses enjoy teaching us. Um, that's a bit close. <laughs> So you're going to be practicing on the people here, are you? Absolutely. Oh, don't do it. <laughs> it was difficult to persuade them that 
they should teach us what to do because they think that we know all those things. But when we persuaded them that we don't really know what we're doing, they were very happy to step in and help us out. There's often an attitude at home that they should be learning from us, but I mean, that's such a ridiculous attitude because we're all working with the same goal in mind. Sorry. Here, I certainly am, yes. And get, it's good to get some experience at this immunisation stuff. What, what's the importance of this sort of care? Oh, it's really good. Um, they've got a very good healthcare system here, primary healthcare, so that if you immunise the kids now, you save less money, save more money on hospital treatment later on, so they don't need to get all these illnesses. Does it come as a shock to you, this sort of treatment? Um, it's are a bit coping? rough and ready, isn't it? Are you coping? <laughs> Am I coping? I'm loving it. <laughs> It's great. It's much more fun than uh, GP surgery at home doing this sort of thing. Found a narrow channel which may get into their direction, but it's only just wide enough clear of wheat so we don't foul our proper. This channel is just wide enough for an 18-inch wide dugout canoe, and we're taking a five-foot boat through here. But we're going in the right direction. That's one thing. Have you seen the hovercraft anywhere? Thank you! Somebody called the biggest there. Yo! Who's the other crew? I'll be uh, Martin and Gareth in the Sea Rider. What's your problem? Both belts have gone. Both belts have snapped. Both it, belts? Both belts. Yeah. One snapped and the other one's slipping. So it was not very far away, but it was uh, after that, of course, we could go nowhere. We tried one. After the first one went, we tried to do asymmetric power, and that didn't work at all. But uh, now we've uh, we've really come to a dead halt. What happened to your hand, Martin? It's bleeding. Uh, just shut on grass. That's all. Do you think the diesel will run too fast if we just go up to hover? No, no, you just bring it up to about 2,500 RPM. In that case, we can hover, in which case you can tow. Exactly. If we carve it down a channel where the canoes disappeared, which is in fact uh, down the far end of this lagoon, yeah. we might uh, get out that way. Okay. things that we've got to do to, to get up now from the UK um, is what we've got, the situation that's happened on this pulley is we've had the wear on this pulley, uh, okay, down in here, and what that's caused is a premature failure in the belt. Now, whether it's due to the belt or the pulley, we're not sure what's gone first, but this belt has gone. Um, the belt has slipped down and has got ruptured in the other belt and made the other belt to fail. Okay, so that's four pulleys. Yes. But uh, the belts, we've actually got spare belts, yeah. but it's not yes. worth fitting the spare belts to this pulley, correct? Gareth, what do you think? Um, no, I don't think it really is, because um, it could cause... We could actually reverse the pulleys, so the wear is on, so there's no wear on the belt on the opposite side. But I think it's actually worth acquiring two new pulleys. Right, Steve, it's your job to get the packs off by 12 o'clock tomorrow so that we don't jeopardise the push to the fly. The drought is off, you can officially have showers now as much as you want. You can flush the toilet as well. Yeah. The no, rainy season has just started it? and it goes on to the middle of June. Oh, I'm sorry, unless I'm faced with some better evidence than this, I can't believe this is a rainy season. No, <laughs> you want? <laughs> how much more rain do you want? I'll go out and check that rain gauge soon, just see how much performance this morning. The southeast dry has turned into a southeast wet. The airstrip's closed. We've got a broken hovercraft that needs spare parts to come in from overseas. It can't be fixed until we do get those parts, which needs the airstrip to be open. So until this weather settles down, 
So we're left with an expedition that can't go ahead. If the expedition can't go ahead, it means that the testing of how far we can go with the medical work can't go ahead as well. So as we look out at the weather here, we just think of what could be at the moment. After a week, the weather improves. It seems that there's just a small bit around the front. The spare parts have finally arrived from the UK. But with time running out, the engineers are spending every daylight hour preparing the hovercraft. Well, what we need to do now is to look in the manual and actually check what deflection we should be getting there. Having failed to reach the Fly River by the swamps at Ali, there's only one option left the dangerous route, out into the estuary. And which you can adjust on there, can't you? Yeah, you can adjust on there, but that's always a set, factory set. And the inside belt seems to, seems to be... Then, out of the blue, comes an emergency, a real test for the hovercraft. We've just had a call from a porter about an hour and a half downriver that they've got a bloke there who's really sick with a death adder bite and they have no anti-venom to be able to treat him, so we've got to get down there quickly to be able to treat him. Now, yeah, astigmine and atropine and antivenom. Death adder and black snake. Death adder, expiry date 695. If he's still alive when we get there, then we'd, we've got every chance of saving his life because it'll work very effectively and very quickly. We've just got to keep it nice and cool for our trip down there. Right, we're ready. Awa, awa. Don't, don't, don't go off, just go straight. Lift up the front. Lift the front up. No, with your feet. Both feet when you when you come in and hit the grass. Lift the front up. Right, like this now. Lift the front. No, oh, oh. Here, let's swap. I'll show you what I mean. Manappy. Okay. Front. So when you hit the big stuff. Up with the front. Ma'am, are we going to get there in time, do you think? Well, with death out of bites, you, you really don't know. It depends on how much of the uh, actual venom that this man has t been injected with by the death adder. And it depends on how big he is, so how diluted the toxin is in his system and it depends on how strong his constitution is. Can't predict, because you can have as little as 20 minutes, 20 to 40 minutes with a death out of bite, or you can have several hours. Hey, James, is that bloke in the sub-centre? Yeah. Right, come on, let's go. Was it a death adder? Do we know? Okay. Magat salami. Malapila suami. Malapila suami. Tawa. Tau. Open his eyes. Okay. Right. So, what have you given him so far, sis? Okay, what we'll give him first is some neostigmine and atropine. Got a syringe I can draw this up in. Tambu. Tambu. Oh, he's had a death out of bite. He's very weak. But he's still able to breathe, so he should live. 
Highly salvageable, I think, will be the term you'd say. Right. We'll soon see whether this is going to work. Give him a bit of Kamali beggar. Now, yeah, is the drip running all right? Turn it on fast, we'll see how good it's going. Oh, OK, we're well, there. That'll make you feel better soon. We'll actually put another needle in your other hand now, too. Get a bigger one in. Right, you ready? Needle. Tough. OK, hook this up. Uh, we now have the death of the anti-venom mixed in this normal saline and we plan on running it in over about half an hour. At the end of half an hour, you should see a marked difference in our patient. Graham, how would he actually be feeling after he'd been bitten? Very weak is actually the, the worst of the symptoms, a terrifying feeling of not being able to breathe. And so not being able to breathe, not being able to swallow, sort of the feeling of choking and suffocating. That's, that's the worst part of it. I mean, he will also have had pain at the bite site and then in the glands in his groin and in his stomach. But that'll be nothing compared with the terror of feeling as if you're about to suffocate. There you go, feeling a bit stronger now. Ask him if he can swallow now. Yeah, he can move, hey? Open your eyes up. Look at me. Look up at me. Without the anti-venom, this man would almost certainly be dead. And without the hovercraft, we wouldn't have got here in time anyway. So I reckon it's proved itself. Yeah, that's good. Bit more strength, eh? Kamali Bini Segata. Local emergencies are one thing, but the expedition still has to reach the Fly River. So we've got left with one alternative, a mighty barmoo, as you put it. It's a long way, um, and this is uh, to a hovercraft, our hovercraft, open sea. What other dangers are there? Well, I'll see it's so much open water there. I mean, it's just going to be the, the difficult conditions with the wind blowing against these craft, because if there's any mechanical failure and one of these mm. things ends up in the water, you've got an immense flow of tide. Yeah. It really roars down through there, and especially after we've had that rain yeah. a week ago where it poured down, and it, yeah. it'll be just roaring out of there. This is the real test for the hovercraft. It's a river rover and not designed for open water, so I don't know how it's going to go. If we can make it through to the fly, then the lives of thousands of people could be improved. And if we don't make it, well, I pray we don't break down, because this is crocodile country. The hovercraft have covered over a hundred miles. That's already 50 miles and many villages more than the hospital has ever reached before. Sisiyami is the last chance for fuel. It's a mission station run by Father Ron Bowman. Hello. Good to see you here. <laughs> Sorry we didn't radio first, but we uh, okay. did on the spur of the moment. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can just come. come. No, we uh, camped around the other side of the island last night. No. Oh, okay. And we decided to come and see you this morning. What we're trying to do from here is to go to the fly. Now, can you tell us about the conditions we're going to expect from here, past your end of your island and down through the passage? There are a few conditions. You have to meet the wind and also the tides. Okay. 
tides are at this time of the year, we're going towards uh, full moon, so very strong tide. It can be dangerous if you meet uh, the big tide. The tide can be up to six feet, seven feet six high. Feet, meet. A feet. wall of water to meet you. Well, so a uh, tidal right. bore. So you have to be careful when yeah. you meet it. But not yeah. now. No, you're, you'd no, be no. okay. okay. This right. time, that's why it's good to go okay. about with right. the tides. No, no. Are we going to meet other dangers such as uh, crocodiles this time of year? <laughs> I hope you have no problem, mechanic, mechanic problem, because uh, there are some on the way. How big are they? They can be over 20 feet long. We have okay. had people killed, uh, eaten alive uh, by crocodile in this area, CCME yeah. and Sogiri. It can be very dangerous. If you stop on the way, don't go outside of the overcraft too far away. Okay. Just 30 miles to go to the fly, but this is the riskiest stretch of the journey. The estuary, with big waves, strong winds, and dangerous tidal areas. So I think it's a river as opposed to a trip. Yeah, it must be a tributary. It certainly isn't uh, seawater because it's a totally different colour and it's flowing out nice and clean. But it looks good. Mighty fly. It's hard not to get a motive when you get at a time like this because it's been so good to work here for all these years. You can't help but be changed when you work in a place like this. All of a sudden you're actually doing something that seems to be very significant and changing a whole lot of lives and that's always good to uh, be able to think that now we can extend the sort of service we've given to people close around Barleymore even way out here onto the Fly River and uh, we can really look forward to seeing what the future will bring for these people. It's great. Morning. Morning. Hello. Which is your village? Seguero. Cabo village.
Encounters travels to the east coast of Australia and chronicles two years in the lives of Sunshade and Jaffa, kangaroos, faces in the mob, this Sunday at 8 o'clock.